Hi, and uh, welcome to this last video on recurrent neural nets. Uh, so this video assumes that you already watched the preceding two videos and also the videos on standard neural networks. So in this video, we're just going to talk a little bit about some considerations to have in mind uh, when working with recurrent neural nets. So just as a recap, right, these recurrent neural nets, we introduce them in order to do machine learning on sequential data. For instance, uh, data like the one shown here, where you have stock prices that develops over time. And the goal is to per se predict uh, the value of the stock tomorrow. And to do this in the previous two videos, right, we introduced this notion of recurrent neural nets, which the idea is that for each time step T, you have some features for that time step and you feed them into the neural net. Uh, it passes through the neural net, produces some output, and then it produces a state which you forward to step T plus one, right? So you kind of, you get some output from the previous step that is fed back into the neural net. Uh, and in some sense, you're reusing the same input neurons for the, for the features for every single time step, right? So, so again, watch the previous videos if this is, uh, is not clear. Good. Now, so let's discuss a few uh, things to, to one can think about when using these recurrent neural nets. So for instance, let's say you've gathered this training data uh, with the stock prices of Google and the historic development of them, and you want to train a recurrent neural net. And as we saw in the previous uh, video, typically you can have many different training sequences, N of them, that you can then feed into your neural net. Now, this sequence here that's visualized on this picture is a very long sequence consisting of some capital T many time steps where you have features for every single time step. And we have some labels as well, which is the, the stock price on the day after. Now, the issue here is that in this training data set, at least the one that's shown here, we actually only have a single training sequence, right? Uh, we don't have many, say, n many training sequences. It's a very long sequence, uh, but we don't have that many. So let me just say that a, a standard approach here that you can uh, think about uh, using here is that if I have such very long sequences, uh, I can break it up into many shorter sequences that I can then use to boost the amount of training data that I have available, right? So for instance, for this very long sequence here, a standard trick is to decide on a particular length, maybe 20 steps, and then you create every uh, yeah, consecutive subsequence of this long sequence as an input. And so for instance, right, you, you take out this small snapshot of the, of the sequence and you create a training sequence that has just those 20 time steps. And you do this for every possible way to place uh, these 20 steps, also with overlaps. And in general, right, you just do this across the whole sequence, which generates much more uh, training data for you. In particular, the length will be, I guess, proportional to uh, the length of this long sequence instead. And so you're basically going to create a, a sequence like for every possible time step you could start in. Right? So this is a very standard trick that you could consider uh, using if we're having a few of these training sequences if they're long. Now, again, also, if you want to use this pre-trained model to make new predictions, maybe you could uh, feed in the past 20 steps matching the length of the training sequences, but you don't really have to. You, you could also make it work with uh, more or less data, in particular because of this reuse of, uh, I guess, variables and, and parameters inside these uh, recurrent neural nets. So, so hopefully your, your trained model could also work well with, with variable length sequences, even if you trained it on, on length 20 sequences. Okay, so let's discuss another thing that you might encounter if trying to use these recurrent neural nets. Uh, so here's another example of type of kind of sequential data is if you're reading text, this is also very sequential and it's a place where you could consider using a recurrent neural net. So for instance here, let's say you want to train a, a spam filter that you will feed in sentences or emails, and it has to predict whether this is a, it's a spam email or a regular email. Now, these are clearly variable length sentences, so it makes sense to try and use uh, a recurrent neural net. And then here you need to decide on what your features are. And a very natural thing is to say that um, I have a feature for every word that occurs uh, in my sentence. So for instance, every single word here becomes a feature. And of course, for this, we need a way to represent uh, a word as a fixed length vector. But in previous videos on word embeddings, we already discussed several ways of doing this, continuous bag of words, skip gram, uh, just a simple one hot encodings and so on. And you can choose one of those and just represent each of these words as a feature vector. Right? So this is something that we know how to, to handle. Now, the issue is that the way that we 
saw recurrent neural nets so far is that they output something for every time step and there's also a corresponding label for every time step right so as you process the sequence every single time you output something and you uh, have maybe a loss function that you apply to this and some desired output label but here in this example where you uh, well, basically, there's only one label you have to predict that uh, somehow it's related to the whole sequence and not every single step of the sequence. Uh, how can you how can you handle this with the recurrent neural net? Right here, we just need to say spam or not spam after reading uh, the whole email. So, if we only have one label for the whole sequence, uh, a standard way of dealing with this is to just, I guess, run the forward pass of the neural net. Right, so just uh, keep feeding back in the state into the next step. Uh, but just don't compute an output after every single time step. So it would look something like this, right? So if you have your sequence of length t, I'd say different words of a sentence, you feed in the first word uh, in the beginning, right? You pass it through the neural net and uh, you forward the state to the next step by multiplying with the, the matrix W onto the hidden layer. And in comes the step two features. You multiply with the matrix U, you add it up with what comes from the previous step, you apply your activation function and you forward it by multiplying it with W and so on, like you would have done in a normal recurrent neural net, except that you don't compute an output after every single time step, only at the end of processing the whole sequence do we actually multiply with this matrix V to get uh, the output neurons that we can then uh, compare or apply the loss function to. Right. And the important thing is that with this modified forward pass, backpropagation uh, still works just as it's supposed to. So, and also maybe it's worth mentioning that we're still sharing U and W across all these time steps, right? So, so hopefully this model will also generalize well to other link sequences and so on, and we'll still learn to, to classify correctly. The idea is just to leave out the output in, in the first many steps. And maybe just to say that backpropagation still works. If you look at this, this is the computation graph we saw in the previous video. Uh, if you're running backpropagation, where you construct this huge uh, computation graph, it's rather complicated if you have here, but basically each of these triangles down here, if you remember, uh, corresponds to, I guess, one step of the computation where in comes the next feature vector, in comes some state from the previous, previous step, like either uh, it comes along the edge here, it comes from this initial dummy state. You take in the feature vectors, you use the V and U uh, matrices, W and U matrices to compute the next hidden state and so on. Right. So this was this giant uh, computation graph that we had. And as we remember, right, each of these steps output, compute an output by using the V matrix, you combine it with the desired label of the step, apply a loss function, and you sum all these losses up. So the only change to this computation graph is basically we get rid of all these outputs in the first many steps. We only have an output here at the end, but the, otherwise it's still a perfectly valid computation graph. And this is why we can still do backpropagation through this computation graph. Okay, another thing that we would like to discuss here uh, regarding these recurrent neural nets is the, the use of activation functions. As so in particular, when we presented uh, these recurrent neural nets in the previous video, we insisted on this activation function in the hidden layer being this hyperbolic tangent function, the tang. So let me say a little bit now about why is this a good choice of activation function and what uh, risks there are if, uh, by choosing other activation functions. So just to remind ourselves, what does this tang look like? Uh, so first of all, there's this uh, sigmoid function that we use for logistic regression which basically takes values between uh, zero and one. Uh, for very negative values, you take values close to zero. For very positive values, you take values close to one. And this tang function is, is just some scaling and, and uh, stretching of the sigmoid function so that you take values between minus one and one instead. So this is the one that we, we used. And uh, let's try to see what happens if we did not use this tang activation function, right? What, what would go wrong if you will, if we say just used identity activation in this middle layer, now just to you know look at an extreme case, the following discussion will be basically just as relevant for relo activation. Uh, well, let's just look at activation to keep it identity activation to keep it uh, as simple as possible. So let's replace this middle layer uh, activation by identity. So now we have identity activation. The update rule changes, right? So the new hidden state in the next step is you, you feed in the input features of step T, you multiply it with U, you add up the previous hidden layer, 
um, outputs and multiply it with the matrix W and, and you get your, your next hidden state. So what can go wrong here? So to just to make it, I guess the example as clean as possible and just to really highlight what, what happens here is, let's just say that your feature vectors XT so the ones that you get in every step, let's just say there's zero except the very first one, just to make the math simpler. And of course, this is not really the case, but well, let's just do it to make the math simpler. So only the first feature vector is non-zero. And also just to keep things simple, let's say the first hidden input is just the zeros vector, this dummy uh, hidden input that we, we start with in the first round. So, so what happens then if we look at the, at the math? So I guess if we say that these feature vectors xt are, are all zero except the first one, then basically the update rule becomes uh, basically this, this term here, right? That uh, depends on xt becomes zero. And the update rule just becomes the hidden state becomes the previous hidden state times w. Okay. And of course, the very first one is special. We said that the x1 might be, be non-zero, right? Just to, something should happen in this network, right? So, so first we get the, I guess from the very first round, we get this uh, this input uh, to the hidden states or, this, or the output of the hidden states. And then for every consecutive step, we multiply with w. Okay. So, so this would be what the hidden neurons output after t steps. They will output, I guess the initial output uh, times w uh, t times. So it's it's really this x1 times u times w raised to the teeth power. Okay. So let's try to understand that a little better. So uh, so we, we have this observation that the hidden output at step t is this initial uh, input vector x1 times u times w to the t. But just to, for shorthand, let's denote by set this x1 times u, and then the output of the hidden neurons after t steps is set times w to the t. And this looks, if you've seen something called the power method, this looks uh, very similar. So let me try to, to elaborate on that. So again, just to keep the math simple, let's just pretend that this w happened to be a symmetric matrix. The problems are still relevant. The, the issues that we'll see will still be relevant, even if it's not. But this is just to make uh, the argument simpler. Let's say that this is a symmetric matrix. Then, uh, I guess, as we also saw in the principal component analysis videos, uh, we can do what's called an eigen decomposition of this matrix W, because this is a square matrix. So this means that we can write W as E times D times E transpose, where uh, e is an orthonormal matrix. In particular, it contains the eigenvectors as uh, as rows, scale to unit length. And D is a diagonal matrix that has these singular values, or eigenvalues, on the diagonal. Okay. So, so what happens when we multiply this matrix W with itself? All right. So if we say, let's just look at the square of this W. So W times W. Now, this, if we expand it out using this eigen decomposition, right, it becomes E, D, E transpose times E, D, E transpose. And so in here in the middle, right, we have E transpose times E. And now orthonormal matrices have the special property that the transpose of the matrix is its own inverse, which means that E transpose E is identity. So it just means that this E transpose E here in the middle disappears. And we have D times D. If I multiply a diagonal with itself, I'm just squaring all the entries on the diagonal. So what I get here is D, E times D squared times E transpose. And now if I repeat this T times, what I end up with is E times D to the teeth power times E transpose. So the effect is really that the eigenvalues of uh, my matrix are raised to the teeth power if I do this for T steps. And so I take in this diagonal matrix, I basically raise all these eigenvalues to the teeth power, which is the same as, as just the whole matrix, the eigenvalues, are the, uh, the eigenvectors are the same and the eigenvalues are raised to the teeth power. Okay. Now, if we play, plug this in, in place of W up here, then HT now is really set times E times D raised to the teeth power times E transpose. So the eigenvalue, if there was an eigenvalue lambda I in the original W, that eigenvalue is now lambda i raised to the teeth power. And if we let mu i be the corresponding eigenvector, then you can show that this ht 
the formula for it is, is like this, right? So you sum over all the eigen uh, values. You take the inner product between the set vector and uh, the corresponding eigenvector. You multiply this number by, uh, by the eigenvalue raised to the teeth power, which is the new, new eigenvalue. And then you multiply this by the eigenvector and sum it all up. So what you can see here is that if these eigenvalues are larger than one, let's say the two or something like this, then this factor here that we're multiplying with is two to the t, right? So it's some, something that grows exponentially with the number of steps uh, that we're performing, which means also that the norm of this output vector grows exponentially with the number of steps. Right? So the And this vector h is the hidden layer, right? So the values in the hidden layer, they grow exponentially fast if at least just one of these eigenvalues is, uh, is greater than one and you have some non-zero inner product onto that uh, eigenvector. Also, if let's say all the eigenvalues are less than one, right? if I take a value less than one and raise it to the teeth power, it becomes super, super small. And, and this means that the norm of, of this vector, the hidden uh, neurons, the output of the hidden neurons, they shrink exponentially fast with the number of steps. Uh, and, and this could be interpreted as saying that things that happen in the beginning of your processing your sequence of T steps, it's basically forgotten, right? Because this the contribution from this vector that you have in the beginning, it just shrinks uh, and dies out exponentially fast. So only the new input that you get in later steps will really be, be relevant. So it's roughly corresponds to forgetting the early steps of, uh, of the sequence when you get towards the end of the sequence. And so this in particular is the reason for insisting on this hyperbolic tangent uh, function, right? Because the effect that it has is that it squeezes the, the values here, right? Regardless of what the input values are, they're squeezed back into the range from minus one to plus one. And so it really avoids this exploding of values that we, we talked about on, on the previous slide, right? That they can grow exponentially fast. So, so this prevents this explosion of, of the values in the hidden neurons. Now, unfortunately, it doesn't really prevent the shrinking of these values. And particularly, you might still forget, uh, I guess, the things that happen in early steps, uh, they will really be forgotten in this in the state that we're sending forward. <clears throat> and forgetting somehow what happened in the beginning of a sequence is a well-known problem for, for recurrent neural nets if you're processing long sequences. And maybe just to continue finish the discussion, right, uh, let's also see that this is actually also a problem during uh, training and it's also known as vanishing gradients. So, so let's try to see here. So if you remember also from the previous video how we trained these uh, recurrent neural nets, I will construct this computation graphs corresponding to this update uh, procedure with all the steps. And if we zoomed in on, I guess the very first step, right? We were basically computing the first hidden uh, neuron outputs here. I guess we take our input feature vector multiplied with u. That's what happens down here. We take our previous hidden step, which is just the, the dummy h0 multiplied with w. We add it up and we apply tanch. And now we have our h1 and so on. Now, let's see what happens if you're trying to do back propagation on this computation graph and you reach this node that says tanch at this activation node. What, is, what will happen here? So if you recall the videos on back propagation, we saw rules for processing activation function nodes in, in such a computation graph. So let's try to look at an example here. All right, so here's the node C that applies an activation function phi to the entries of uh, a vector that passes through. So let's say for this example, right, that this phi function is the tanch function, right, which is what we were looking for in, uh, in our uh, recurrent neural nets. Now, during the forward pass, right, we will evaluate the tanch function entry-wise on, on the vector that comes in, 3,2. So we'll get about 0 0.995 in the first entry and minus 0 0.964 in the second entry, giving us uh, a vector here for the forward pass of about 0 0.995 minus 0 0.964. Okay. Then you, you finish your forward pass and you start doing the backwards pass. And at some point, right, you, you reach this node and you have some, some gradient from uh, further up the computation uh, graph. And now you need to uh, pass this through uh, this node uh, that, that applies the activation function. So we saw previously that if you have such a node, what you have to memorize is that you have this special rule for uh, 
I guess the, if you can call it, they say the partial derivative of f with respect to this node b, what we have to write on, on the edge down here is that we have to take what we already wrote on the on the edge here to c. This is our partial derivative with respect to c. So this is the 10 comma minus 8 vector here. And then we have to multiply it with this special matrix here. And this matrix is a diagonal matrix where on the diagonal entries, we have to put, well, we have to take the derivative of the activation function phi, and then we have to evaluate it on, on these inputs that came from the forward pass, so on three and two. So the derivative of the hyperbolic tench function is one minus the square of this tench function. And so let's try to see what this matrix will look like. And so one minus the square of the tench function here on three is 0 0.01 roughly. And one minus the tench squared of minus two is about 0 0.07. So what happens here is that we have to take out 10 comma minus eight, our gradient up here and multiply it uh, with this matrix here with 0 0.01 on the diagonal and 0 0.07 on the diagonal. And so if we do this, our new gradient here is like 0 0.1 and minus 0 0.56. So these values, they really shrunk a lot, which is also what is referred to as vanishing gradients. So these gradients get much smaller when we take a step through this uh, activation node here. And so basically, if we look at our computation graph here, when we're doing backprop through this tench node here, we're multiplying our gradients from up further up the computation graph by a matrix with very small values in the diagonal entries, which is going to shrink the values of, uh, of this gradient. Okay. But now this is not the only place the tench appears, right? If we had the whole computation graph here and one of the paths through this computation graph, in particular the one relating where, uh, where we have some state that's been forwarded through all these time steps until we get to the last time step. And if we want to sort of, you could argue that if you want to somehow capture dependencies by between things that happen late in the sequence and early in the sequence, these dependencies must be really captured by the state that's being forwarded, right? So somehow this must be learned through what's being forwarded along this red path. Now, the problem is that inside each of these steps is, uh, when we're doing backpropagation, is the multiplication of a matrix with very small entries on the diagonal, right? And this is going to happen for every single time step. So once when we're following this path through the computation graph doing backpropagation, these gradients that are kind of forwarded along this path, they really go down exponentially fast with this number of steps. And, uh, and this really means that long-term dependencies are, are really tricky to learn for, for recurrent neural nets. And this is, again, also referred to as, as vanishing gradients. Uh, they really get uh, hit down to, towards zero. And so, so this is something to keep in mind for uh, recurrent neural nets. And uh, there's lots of research trying to address this. And one very popular alternative is the so-called LSTMs standing for a long short-term memory. We will not cover those in, in this video, uh, but this is something you can, you can have a look at. So with all of this, let's just try to, to summarize what we've said about these recurrent neural nets in the past three videos. So recurrent neural nets are neural nets that are tailored towards processing uh, sequential data where um, some of the benefits include sharing of parameters across time steps because the features for every single time step are fed in to the same uh, input neurons of, uh, of the network. And uh, you can process variable length sequences as another benefit. You can train it via stochastic gradient descent and backpropagation like standard neural nets. And also it has this notion of forwarding state uh, between different steps of, of processing uh, sequences. One downside that's worth mentioning is that it can be tricky for recurrent neural nets to, to probably learn uh, long-term dependencies, meaning things that relate, uh, where it's important to know some, remember something from uh, early in the sequence when you're processing something late in the sequence. Okay, so that in concludes our discussion of uh, recurrent neural nets.